Starting a new era with Coach Mike McDonald, the Seahawks have made a number of intriguing additions in free agency, but might their biggest addition going into 2024 be a returning player from injury? We're going to be breaking it all down on our Wednesday edition of Locked On Seahawks. You are Locked On Seahawks, your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings 12. This is Corbin Smith, host of the Locked On Seahawks podcast, your daily Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Glad to be joined as always by my co-host in crime, Rob Rang, and a special thanks to each and every one of the 12s out there. Thank you for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week, whether you're listening from Suez, Egypt, or Ocean Shores, Washington. A special thanks to each and every one of you. We are now two weeks away, just a hair over two weeks away from the NFL draft starting in Detroit. We're going to continue our prospect preview series with defensive tackles, and we're going to check out the three latest reported top 30 visits for the Seahawks as well. In a jam-packed episode brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more right now. New customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, bucks, win or lose. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Now for your lead story here on our Wednesday edition of Locked On Seahawks. Since the new league year started in the middle of March, the Seahawks have now signed 11 free agents to their roster, including some depth pieces on the offensive line. They've completely turned over the safety group with Rayshon Jenkins coming in, Kayvon Wallace. They re-signed Leonard Williams. So it has been an active free agency for the Seahawks, maybe not of the position some fans wanted to see the Seahawks be aggressive at, but nonetheless, there have been a lot of additions, and yet I was looking at some numbers. We remember how things played out last year, Rob. Uchenna Nuosu, who spoke with the media today, we got to hear about his recovery. He says he absolutely will be ready to go for the start of training camp. That may be the best news the Seahawks have gotten this entire offseason as I think you could make a really good argument when you look at how this defense self-destructed in the last 11 games last year without him. You could make a very strong argument that this is the biggest addition that the Seahawks are going to be making to their defense in 2024. Yeah, the statistics paint a, a pretty dire picture for the Seahawks in terms of when Uchenna Nuosu was on the field uh, and when he was not, and just how much Seattle's run defense plummeted. Uh, when Uchenna Nuosu, of course, went down with a torn pectoral injury in October, and everything changed at that point. And we talked about it, of course, when the injury occurred. I mean, we we knew that Uchenna Nuosu was pound for pound, arguably Seattle's most physical defensive player, um, that he was able to provide not only a consistent pass rush, but but also was able just to set the edge. And very few other edge defenders for the Seahawks were able to do that at even close to the level that number 10 provided for the Seahawks. Look, Boye Mafe did a great job, uh, you know, for half of the season. I mean, that seven game stretch, I mean, he was among the best pass rushers in all of the NFL, and he certainly made strides in the running game as well. We, we saw flashes from uh, Daryl Taylor. We saw flashes from Derek Hall, but never the consistency that Uchenna Nuosu provided. And so to me, it, it makes an argument for why the Seahawks are, are bringing in players like Jared Verse, who we talked about before. Some are, uh, you know, positioning or, or some are uh, arguing that the Seahawks might be considering a player like a Dallas Turner. Should he fall in their lap? A Leatu Latu? Should he fall to them at number 16 overall? Because when you go from Uchenna Nuosu to, say, Daryl Taylor, who, of course, has been more burst than power at the point of attack, then, and then that would be the biggest argument for that. So I 100% I agree with you when you uh, just claim that um, that bringing or Uchenna Nuosu's return to health might just be the, the biggest offseason addition for the Seahawks. Again, I, I love some of the players that Seattle has brought in, but a healthy Uchenna Nuosu is basically the difference between a, a top 20 kind of a defense uh, or one of the defenses that was, you know, quite frankly, one of the worst in all of the NFL last season, especially against the run. 
the numbers are just damning when you can when you consider just the gap. It was the run defense plummeted like you were free falling in a crevasse on Mount Everest. That's how bad it was. And I went in and looked at the stats today, and we all knew how this defense played after Chen Nwosu got hurt. But again, you look at these numbers, Rob. The first six games, the Seahawks had a top five top five run defense. They were giving up eighty seven point two rushing yards per game during those first six games. They gave up only nine runs of 10 or more yards in those six games, so barely more than one 10-yard run per game. They weren't giving up explosives. They were giving up 3.5 yards per carry, which is the third best mark. And then look how everything just fell off of a flat earth like Kyrie Irving was watching this team play run defense. (laughs) You, you look at the numbers after Nuosu got hurt. They're 32nd, dead last in every category. They gave up 166.3 yards per game on the ground, five yards per carry, 18 rushing touchdowns in 11 games. To put that in perspective, Rob, there were 13 teams last year that gave up fewer rushing touchdowns for the entire season than what the Seattle Seahawks did in those last 11 games. And I know there were other factors that played into this self-destruction, but there's no question that the biggest issue was Daryl Taylor, Derek Hall, whoever the Seahawks tried to plug in when they moved Draymond Jones over to edge to try to set the edge. It didn't matter who was replacing Nuosu. Boy, Mafe was fine. He was an adequate run defender and he gave him a lot of punch as a pass rusher, but as you mentioned, this is why you're looking at Jared Verse and thinking if he falls to 16, we are going to be inclined to make that selection because Jared Verse is a very good run defender. He's physical and obviously has the burst to get after the quarterback as well, disruptive in the backfield. This is a team right now that there's a lot of unknowns in the sense of Derek Hall and who knows what Daryl Taylor's going to do with his new coaching staff. But the drop off there, I don't know that I have ever seen a unit on offense or defense. I mean, you can make the argument when a quarterback goes down. We've seen some offenses just completely fall apart, but non-quarterback situation where an offense or defense fell apart the way this defense did when Nuosu got hurt, it's incredible. And last year, only playing in six games, he was in the top 12 for PFF and run stop percentage among edge defenders. So he was a very big part of that success they had early in the season. As soon as he got hurt, They had to plug in some of these other backups that just simply did not get the job done. And opponents ran right at them, particularly in short yardage situations. And the other thing that's stunning, Rob, when you look at these stats, I mentioned the nine runs of 10 plus yards. The Seahawks gave up 51 such runs in the last 11 games. So we're talking almost five of them per game. And they, of course, were dead last in that category as well. They are 32nd in every single category. So I don't care what anyone says. There were obviously other factors at play here that that contributed to this drop-off. I don't think the Seahawks would have stuck in the top five all year long. But if Nwosu was healthy, they certainly would not have self-destructed the way they did. This was beyond an implosion. And so the importance of getting him back and adding another viable edge that can also play the run, those are both really important things. They've checked off one box That's why they're looking so close at these guys in the draft, particularly early round prospects. You can throw Chop Robinson in there as well. His run tape is not bad, and he's got the attitude. I think he grows into that. He could be a solid run defender. No, he he absolutely could. Um, You know, but but again, I I think that it really what it comes down to is just the the length, the power, and just the nastiness that Uchenna Nuosu plays. I mean, I I don't think if there is a a college player in this class, Corbin. uh, You know, my my top pick is as far as the players that we just mentioned: Chop Robinson, Liatu Latu, Dallas Turner, um, and then again Jared Verse. My top uh, my top selection of those for the Seahawks and trying to duplicate Uchenna Nuosu. Woes, whose physicality at the line of scrimmage easily would be Jared Verse in that regard. Look, I, I like a lot of these other prospects, but uh, again, to me, the 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 real news here is just the return to health of Nuchena Nuosu. As you said, um, you know, he was uh, you know speaking to reporters today um, and just reassuring Seahawks fans of his health. And this is a torn pectoral. It's a significant injury, significant surgery, but it is not like it's a spinal. It's not like it's a a, a torn ACL or thing 
things of that nature. So I do think that the Seahawks should feel confident that they have Nuosu coming back at full health. Um, of course, they, they have made the second round investments in Daryl Taylor, in Derek Hall, in Boye Mafe in recent years. So I don't think that this means necessarily that the Seahawks have to take an edge rusher in the first round because they do presumably are going to have all of these players back. And, you know, in the case of the, especially the younger players, hopefully ascending. Um, but at the same time, I think that they just kind of goes back to how physical, how rare of a player Nuchena Nuosu was. It was one of the reasons why I celebrated the signing when Seattle initially brought him over from the LA Chargers. I thought he was kind of a, a round peg in a square hole in LA because, of course, they had a couple of, uh, of superstars there in Bosa and, and, and Khalil Mack at that time. So I just think that Nuchena Nuosu brings a different level of physicality than the Seahawks currently have at that edge rusher role. Um, and so when he was lost for the season, the drop off as you said was was significant when we come back we are going to shift our focus back to top 30 visits and we've got a couple of really intriguing players that could be early round pick candidates that visited the vmac we're going to be diving in up next here on our wednesday edition of locked on seahawks It's playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every single game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets. Guaranteed, that's $150, bucks, win or lose. Bet on everything from Sidney Crosby's slap shots to Vlad Guerrero Jr. home runs to Jason Tatum slam dunks, all on an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. You're listening to the Wednesday edition of Locked on Seahawks. This is your host, Corbin Smith. Glad to be joined, as always, by my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. And a special thanks to all the 12s out there. Thank you for making Locked on Seahawks your first listen five days a week. We greatly appreciate it. We are now winding down top 30 visits. Teams are going to start putting all the hay in the barn, and they're going to be focused on the actual draft. Now that we are two weeks away from the first round kicking off in Detroit, and some exciting names that we learned today have been at the VMAC. And I want to start in the defensive line with our first one, because we talked about Tavondre Sweat from Texas yesterday. He was not the only nuisance that opponents had to deal with last year with a dominant defensive line. Byron Murphy, the second, a former high school running back. So you're talking about a great athlete at around 300 pounds. He put on a clinic at the NFL Combine, a really athletic guy that, oh, by the way, also was a damn good football player. He also visited the Seahawks for a top 30 visit and this feels like one of those players. We mentioned Jerzon Newton from Illinois. We've talked about Cooper DeGene from Iowa. Some of these defensive positions that may be as top of the line needs for the Seahawks in short term. But Byron Murphy II is another one of those players with his athletic ability and his disruptive ability as a penetrator at the line of scrimmage, can man himself against double teams as well, that this could be a player that's on that short list that John Schneider would have interest in picking at 16 or after a trade down. Yeah, I mean, he's one of those guys that uh, just feels like an ascending player. Um, you know, he, he only started one game a, a, two years ago and one game previous to that. But then he winds up starting every game for the Texas Longhorns this past season and was the was voted the Big 12 Defensive Lineman of the Year. And as you mentioned, uh, you know, the, his experience at the running back position just kind of suggests what a terrific athlete that he is. He's six foot one, 297 pounds and he has great initial quickness whether it be upfield to be a penetrator or laterally to be able to do twists and stunts we know how much that mike mcdonald has has made things of that nature all the different games that he used as line of scrimmage to to create uh, you know pass rush opportunities for his players at the baltimore ravens and previously the michigan wolverines i think that the byron murphy the second would make an awful lot of sense for the seahawks uh you know i agree with you i I really think that Byron Murphy II is going to be among the I mean, maybe a handful of defensive players that the Seahawks have to consider. I think that it's still much more likely they're going to go in the first round. We've talked about that ad nauseum, but still, 
Byron Murphy II is one of those guys that just feels like his best football is still ahead of him. Um, and then again, considering his quickness, considering his power, and considering how Mike McDonald used such a strong rotation among defensive linemen um, in Baltimore, I really think that uh, that Byron Murphy II um, is somebody that the Seahawks should be paying attention to. And I love the fact that uh, that the Seahawks brought in both of the two defensive tackles from Texas here. I, I think that it's I'd be curious to be the fly on the wall to hear what Byron Murphy II had to say about Devondre Sweat and what Devondre Sweat had to say about Byron Murphy. And of course, the Seahawks know that. And uh, I think that both of them in very different types of players, but both of them could actually fit in very nicely for the Seahawks. I do not see Murphy being a carbon copy of Justin Matabuke, but I see a lot of traits that are similar in terms of his penetration sure. ability, that quick initial first step. Hasn't had the pass rushing production yet, but I could see him being a player that would be able to generate a lot of pressures and maybe more sacks at the next level. Because like you said, he seems to be an ascending player that really was only a full-time starter for one year with the Longhorns. Now let's switch to the secondary with one of the players that I feel like has created the most split-haired analysis as far as secondary players in this draft class. And that's Cameron Kinchins from Miami. And the reason that I say it's created a split hair controversy, so to speak on film, this guy looks the part of a solid second round selection. And if you look at his 2022 tape, Rob, you could make an argument if he was eligible to be in the draft last year, that he might've sniffed the first round in a safety class that wasn't very good. But this guy's got 11 interceptions, two of them returning for touchdowns, in just the last two years alone playing against ACC competition, 162 total tackles, created some forced fumbles, got his hands on several pass breakups. There's a lot to like about this kid, his aggressive playing style. He has elite instincts. But then you look at what he did at the combine, ran a 4.65 40-yard dash, had a 35-inch vertical, 5'11", 202, you expect a guy at that build to be a little bit more explosive, and he didn't do much better at his pro day. His relative athletic score was in the low twos on a 10-point scale for the safety position. That is not ideal when you're looking at guys when you're secondary, but he looks so much faster on tape. And so this really creates that interesting discussion about where this kid should fall in terms of football player, senior bowl standout versus, oh man, the athletic testing. Is he going to be able to transfer these skills to the next level? I'm still very high on this kid, but I can understand the arguments about the athletic testing. And he did give up 470 plus receiving yards and four touchdowns last year. He took a regressive step back in that regard, giving up explosive plays, but he still had a lot of interceptions. I'm still high on this kid, but I can understand some of the skepticism too. No, again, uh, it's kind of like what you said before about Uchenna Nuosu and how uh, you know the Seahawks defense basically fell into that crevasse. I mean, the, the, with, with Cameron Kinchins, you're talking about a player. The, the, the peaks and valleys are just so significant. Uh, you know, again, those of you watching on YouTube can see 11 interceptions, and all 11 of those came in the last two seasons at Miami. Uh, I would say the same thing is true in terms of his run support. I mean, if you just wanted to create a highlight reel then there is no safety in this class. And I'll include Cooper DeJean in that. In that. There is no safety in this class who has more uh, impressive highlights than Cameron Kitchens. The, I'm not sure that there's a safety in this class who has more disturbing lowlights than Cameron Kitchens as well. Sometimes his, uh, you know, his track to the football is, is not what it needs to be. And you see the shortcomings in terms of straight line speed. It, it was a 4.65 second time at the 40 yard dash uh, it was a uh, a nine foot two broad jump which usually there's a correlation between the explosiveness of the jumps and the 40 yard dash time so the fact that it was a nine foot two inch broad jump that that's something usually you see among defensive linemen and when we talked about byron murphy a moment ago byron murphy at 297 pounds had a nine foot three inch broad jump 
So again, Cameron Kitchens, 90 pounds lighter, yep. you know, coming in an inch shorter. I mean, the, the, again, it just the 40 yard dash time was not a fluke. And those of you who watched the, the 40 yard dash time, uh, you know, on the NFL network, you saw Cameron Kitchens basically look up at the clock and where it says his time, he didn't look the least bit surprised by that 40 yard dash time. And as you mentioned in his pro day, he is, wasn't much faster. So to me, that's really what this comes down to. There's no question that Cameron Kinches has terrific ball skills. He's got great instincts. He typically takes a direct line to the football. But considering the quarterback and receiver talent that I see in the NFC West, to me, this is a player that we're talking about third, fourth round rather than the second round grade. The otherwise, I felt pretty comfortable with him at that spot as well. I just think that the Seahawks, if you bring him into this division, you would better have better cornerback play in a much fiercer, more consistent pass rush because you're going to have to protect a free safety with this kind of marginal straight line speed. Yeah, and you're not going to be able to suddenly turn this guy into a 4-4-5 speedster. Like, that just doesn't happen. So his instincts make up for that a lot of the time. But this is certainly a player that I feel like, it's like I said again, there's a lot of split hair discussions because there's so many of those highlights and yet – there are the bad plays on film that consistently show up. And then the athletic testing not being where you expected it to be, and at least in my opinion. I didn't expect him to run a blazing fast time before 6'5", and the broad jump was way worse than I anticipated. For a player of his size, I thought he'd be close to 10 or a little over 10 feet, and, and that just didn't happen. One last top 30, and we just mentioned two guys that have been big names in their position groups during this draft cycle And we're going to shift gears to a player that is on the other side of the coin. And it's an offensive lineman from Pitt, Matt Gonzalez. And I know there's a C in his name. Those of you watching on YouTube, it is not Goncalves. It is Gonzalez. So make sure that we make it clear here. But this is a guy 6'6", 330 pounds, Rob. Did not play most of the season for Pittsburgh last year due to injuries. But he has started quite a few games at both tackle spots. He also has previous experience at guard, which with shorter arms, as you and I were talking about before the show, that is probably where the Seahawks are looking to him right now as a potential late round undrafted flyer. And those are some guys you need to bring in for these top 30s as well. It is not just first and second round caliber players. Well, I, I think they will wind up getting drafted. I mean, I, I see a guy certainly that I believe is a draftable commodity. But as you mentioned, I think that most likely going to be inside the guard position. 33, to, uh, 33 and a quarter inch arm, 6'6", 330 pounds. He's a really big physical player that can be a good drive blocker. I don't think that he has the lateral agility to, to remain outside at the tackle position. He played both left and right tackle at Pitt and obviously all ACC competition. He's a good football player. May have been a top 100 prospect had he been able to play his entire senior season, but he suffered a toe injury. I believe it was in week three. It was against West Virginia and wound up having to go undergo surgery. And then one of the things I was concerned about, we mentioned the, you know, the struggles in the workouts of Cameron Kitchens. I want to see a little bit more strength from the Pittsburgh offensive lineman Gonzalez. 19 repetitions of 225 pounds, considering that he has been away from the football field due to a foot injury, but not upper body injury. I was really hoping to see a little bit more power, but you see the power on tape. So again, like Cameron Kinches, I think you can kind of split some hairs here in terms of do you put too much focus on workouts when the game film shows that both Kinchins and Gonzalez are both good football players that I think somebody may wind up getting themselves a steal if they if they fall too far, but probably both fall into day three. When we come back, we are going to continue our position by position 2024 NFL draft preview. We're going to stay in the trenches with defensive tackles. We've talked about a few of these guys already in today's show, but we're going to take an extensive period to dive into day two prospects and day three sleepers. We'll get to that here in a moment on our Wednesday edition of Locked On Seahawks. You're listening to the Wednesday edition of Locked On Seahawks. This is your host, Corbin Smith. A special thanks to all the 12s that are tuning in. Thank you, thank you, thank you, as always, for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. My co-host in crime, Rob Rang, and I greatly appreciate it. 
Let's shift gears back to the NFL draft. We are just a few hours away from it being two weeks until the NFL draft. It's going to be here before you know it. We've talked about guards. We've looked at offensive tackles. We're going to look now in the trenches on defense, the defensive tackle position. Now, Jerzon Newton, he, in my opinion, is the number one defensive tackle in this class. I think Byron Murphy II, who we just talked about at a top 30 with the Seahawks, also had a combine visit with the team as well. Those two players seem like the consensus first rounders in this draft class. But I know that you have another player who some may view as a defensive end in a 4-3 scheme that you think could sneak into the first round, early second round, that may have some defensive tackle flexibility. Yeah, Darius Robinson from Missouri, absolutely, to me, would make a lot, a lot of sense. I mean, six foot five, 285 pounds, Corbin. And when I saw this player, uh, you know, on tape, I thought, my goodness, we're looking at another version of Jadavion Clowney. I mean, this guy has got arms that just go for days. I mean, it's like literally 35 and a half inch arms, and he just uses that length to create opportunities for himself. I'd like to see a more instinctive player. I'd like to see him be able to bat passes down at the line of scrimmage, but because of his length, because again, six foot five, 285 pounds, he is big enough to be that edge rusher, able to, uh, you know, be a run supporter on the outside that we were talking about earlier has been a, a huge area of concern, at least when Trinidad Mimosa went down due to injury this past season, as well as be able to slide inside. And he's, he's got good coordination between his upper and lower body. He really is able to, uh, kind of split, uh, you know, kind of slip his body and and slither through the the traffic inside to be able to create opportunities for himself and for teammates where I was most impressed with Darius Robinson is how he was able to, you know, kind of just take his game to a whole other level this past season, carry that through to the senior bowl where he was arguably the most dominant defensive player at any position at the senior bowl. We know how much the Seahawks have prioritized what they see in mobile when it comes to draft day. So I don't think that Darius Robinson is likely a candidate for number 16 overall, but if the Seahawks do in fact, trade down as we have talked about so many times before, Corbin. Then I really think that Darius Robinson from Missouri is going to be a player that either the Seahawks will take. I wouldn't be surprised at all. My last mock draft, I had him going to the Baltimore Ravens. So again, to me, he is the type of player that the Seahawks and the Ravens have shown a great deal of interest in in the past. If you're looking for defensive tackles that are 325 plus pounds, that are going to be able to jump in and play for you immediately. This is not a class where you're going to find very many guys that check off that bill. If you're looking for 285 to 295 pound guys that are really athletic and can get after the quarterback, then this class could be for you. There's a lot of day two options that I expect to go off the board in the second and third round that would fit that penetrator style in the interior. And Ruka Roro from Clemson is number one on my list for those guys on day two. You want to talk about an ascending player who didn't play much football before he went to Clemson. This is a guy that last year had a career high in sacks, quarterback hits, pressures in the ACC. You can see the motor. He plays to the whistle. And I think he's really made strides as a run defender as well. Aurora and... Dwayne Carter from Duke. That is another player that we have not talked about much on this show. His last season with the Blue Devils wasn't near as good as a pass rusher. But if you turn on the tape from 2022, this guy looked like a potential first round pick for the Blue Devils. Last, I don't know if it was health related or what, but he just didn't play with quite the same athleticism and tenacity that we saw the year before but this is a really intelligent player that is around 300 pounds can get after the quarterback and really has the athleticism that you are looking for Michael Hall Jr. from Ohio State is another one 476 40 yard dash at 289 pounds so another freak athlete at that size that can penetrate was in the top 12 in the country last year in pressures for interior defensive linemen all three of the players I just mentioned are 300 pounds or lighter, but they play bigger than that and certainly have the athleticism to cause a lot of problems, splitting gaps and penetrating the backfield, which is crucial in today's NFL. All of those guys I could see gone in the second, early third round. 
Yeah, and a couple other players I think are likely to go on day two that I think are basically plug and play kind of options. Brandon Dorless from Oregon, I've talked about so many times before. I he's kind of the exact opposite of Byron Murphy. I mean, Dorless has been a guy, he's been a three-time all pac 12 player. He gets his hands into the air and is able to knock down passes, had nine passes defense just this past season, led all of college football among defensive linemen. Byron Murphy, the second from Texas, as athletic as he is doesn't have a single pass breakup in three seasons at Texas. So again, you're talking about a guy who has, you know, is kind of on the upswing compared to a guy that is basically as proven as it gets. And, you know, if, if you want to go with proven, then, you know, Mike McDonald is going to know better than anybody exactly what Chris Jenkins is. I mean, he was, a, uh, you know, was the, the defensive player of the year, or at least tied for it at, at Michigan this past season. And of course is uh, the son of a four time NFL, Pro Bowler uh, of the same name of the Carolina Panthers. So to me, those are a couple of the players that that really I find intriguing. And we talked before about Devondre Sweat. Look, if the Seahawks want that traditional nose guard, they just had him in Seattle just a couple of days ago and in a visit. Um, so Devondre Sweat at six foot five, 360 pounds is completely different body type than the other players that we mentioned. And that's why I think that day two is kind of the sweet spot for those defensive linemen and why it makes all all the sense in the world for Seattle to try and trade back, acquire the extra, extra selection to be able to get one of these big bodies that might be able to help that run defense that finished 32nd overall once you turn into uh, got injured, but was 31st overall, even with you turn into on the field. If you consider all 17 games of last season. Yeah, this class of defensive tackle is right in the middle of the pack as far as I'm concerned because I really like the first three rounds. It isn't necessarily a top-heavy group where you're just looking at a couple blue-chip players and then there's a big drop-off. There's a lot of really good players on day two. I think where the drop-off is going to be noticed is once you cross over into day three. There might be a couple decent players that are available early in the fourth round. But you're going to be taking gambles on developmental players for the most part at this point. And if you're looking for big guys, there are very few above 325 pounds you're going to found, find they're going to be ready to jump in and play any snaps for you. Again, a lot of those sub-300, sub-305 pound guys, there's a few of them that would make some sense here in day three. As far as sleepers go, one name that I want to mention that you and I are both going to talk about, Christian Boyd from Northern Iowa. John Schneider has been pretty averse for the most part. He has not been interested in picking FCS players. Not that it hasn't happened. There's been a few examples, but he generally likes power five players, those prospects over FCS guys. At the same time, this is a player in Christian Boyd who had a fantastic circuit pre-draft at his all-star showcase and also tested really well at Northern Iowa's Pro Day. And he is a player that it feels like with the explosiveness, another really athletic guy that's bigger. He, he is well over 300 pounds. So he is not going to fall in that undersized category, but he's got plus athleticism for his size. He's not going to be ready to jump in right away, but he could be a starter caliber player if molded in time. So to me, of day three sleepers, there's him and then there's a big gap because I just feel like the potential there is through the roof if the right coaching staff can get a hold of it. Yeah, he's 6'2", 330 pounds, Corbin, and he is super powerful. I believe he has 38 repetitions uh, on the bench press out his pro day. And yep. we have to mention the pro day because he was not invited to the combine. To me, that was a ridiculous snub because uh, Christian Boyd's a good football player. You watch him on tape and his initial quickness, and again, that power really stands apart. He was a, a standout at the East-West Shrine Bowl. And and the Seahawks ha have been a club that has been uh, you know willing to take some of these players from the East West Shrine Bowl and have them turn into to studs for them. So to me, I 100% agree. He is a player that I think that we need to be talking about. I'll mention another player, uh, Fabian Lovett, the uh, Fabian Lovett Senior. And it, we, I say senior because he has a three year old son of the same name, um, and, and he is a guy that initially was at Mississippi State um, and, and wound up transferring to Florida State. And it's pretty rare you see a guy transfer to another school and become 
become a team captain. But that's exactly what Fabian Levitt did. And I mentioned before with Darius Robinson, 35 inch arms, same thing here with Levitt. Uh, this is a guy who's six foot four, he's 310 pounds, he's got 35 inch arms, and he just does a great job of being that classic two gapper. This isn't a penetrator, this isn't a guy that is going to wind up being a, a top 100 selection, but I do believe that he is a future longtime player in the NFL. To me, this is exactly the kind of guy that you're looking for on day three that can be kind of one of those building blocks. And so, again, Fabian Lovett Sr. from Florida State could be a player that fits in with the Mike McDonald defense that uh, the Seahawks might view as a diamond in the rough, even though from coming from Florida State, he certainly uh, played at a high level of competition. As you mentioned, on day three, you are looking for guys that have traits and you really want to find players that, you know, maybe have one or two skills that really jump out that are NFL caliber. And so when I'm looking at these guys on day three, I don't see a lot of balanced all around developed players. They're not there on day three, but Logan Lee from Iowa and I've raved about Iowa guys. I just love the way they develop players there for the NFL he was in the top 10 in the country for interior defensive linemen in sacks last year and had a really good pass rush win rate. So there's that trait that jumps out to you, the pass rushing ability as a rotational player. 5.05 40-yard dash, not the fastest time ever, but he moves fairly well on film. Not the most explosive athlete, but he gets after the quarterback. And then Marcus Harris from Auburn. He has not gotten much buzz during this pre-draft process, in part because he weighs 280 pounds. He is on the small, small side of the spectrum, and yet he was one of the most productive pass rushers in the entire country last year at Auburn. This guy knows how to split gaps. If you're looking for that rotational passing down interior defensive lineman that can come in and give you some snaps early, I think Marcus Harris is that guy who's done really well against SEC competition that could come in and find that niche as a situational interior pass rusher, had really good numbers getting pressure on quarterbacks, a very high pass rush win rate in the top five in the country in his position. So size is going to be holding him back, but that is a guy that on film, you can see the explosiveness and the ability to get after the quarterback late on day three. He would be a fun player to take a flyer on that could potentially play for you some snaps as a rookie as always you can follow me on x and threads at corbin smith nfl you can follow rob at rob rang make sure to subscribe to locked on seahawks on youtube or wherever you listen to your podcast to make sure you don't miss a single episode when i come back tomorrow we're gonna be riding solo on our thursday episode of course i'm gonna be talking running backs we gotta have a running back episode look at, at the running backs that the seahawks could consider mostly on day three in this year's draft class. I'll be breaking it all down on tomorrow's show. Make sure that you listen in. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday night. Go Hawks.